A hybrid reptile is when you have one species and another species, they breed and they make something totally different. And although this is a very controversial subject, I'm not gonna shy away from it. And I think there's gonna be five brand new hybrids in 2023, and I'm gonna tell you all about them. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. I've always liked the topic of hybrids. Now there are certain people that feel a certain way about them. You either love them or you hate them. Me, I think that it's not quite as simple and we're gonna tackle that in this video. In fact, these top five is the very first top five I ever did was the top five hybrid reptiles. But today we're talking about the ones that have not been made yet to my knowledge and the ones I think could be made this year. Now, of course, if you are a, uh, very intelligent person. I'm not, by the way. I just did a little bit of research and figured out these could breed and maybe will, but if I'm wrong and there's no possible way, let me know in the comments. But also, this year we had a brand new one. We had ball pythons and green tree pythons that crossed and made a hybrid, and I was told three years ago that could never happen, so you never know. Okay, that's enough. Let's get into it. Number five, scrub pythons and reticulated pythons. Now, retics have bred with berms. They've bred with ball pythons. We've seen hybrids with retics before. I'm not too aware of scrub python hybrids, but here's why I think this would be so cool. Scrub pythons are wildly underrated. They are, uh, as Brian Cusco would say, a man's snake. This is a very cool snake. They're from Australia, uh, from, well, that area of the world, right? Papua New Guinea, that area. And then we've got reticulated pythons, which are from Asia. We actually found reticulated pythons in Asia in the wild. It almost got me right in that uh, area here. There's a video right here, if you wanna watch a python almost bite my, Anyway, the reason I think it would be cool is because of the five largest pythons in the world, retics are number one for length, and then we've got scrub pythons kind of near the end because they are long, but they aren't girthy. Now, reticulated pythons shouldn't be girthy. There are channels you see where they are, but they definitely should not be that way. So if you take two species that are supposed to be not girthy, supposed to be more slender and long, and two species that do really well on perches and trees because they're semi-arboreal, I think you'd get a really cool animal that would work really, really well. Similar requirements for heat and humidity, not exactly the same, of course. And I think with hybrids, this is why I'm kind of nervous to see how the green tree python ball python hybrids work, because you got an arboreal snake with a terrestrial, mostly terrestrial snake. So we'll see, but having a scrub along with a retic would be really cool. And I think because they both have really interesting head shapes, they're both very interesting the way they move, very intelligent. This is, in my opinion, it could have been number one, but I was actually talking with another, uh, well, I guess a TikTok personality, Instagram personality, KJ2Cozy, and he was talking about the possibility. So anyway, it sparked my interest and because of that conversation, we're making that video. So thanks, buddy. Let's move on to the next one. Number four, ball pythons and spotted pythons. Okay, so this one is really interesting because I've never seen an Antaresia, right? So spotted pythons are in the Antaresia family. Antaresia is a genus with, well, it used to be four, now three species. So uh, Stinson's pythons, I guess which are children's pythons now, and pygmy pythons or anthill pythons and spotted pythons. Either way, spotted pythons are one of my favorites. I talk about them all the time. This is the smallest genus of python in the world, where with ball pythons, Pythons, they are kind of in the middle. They're gonna get five or maybe six feet for a big female. They're amazing. You've seen lots of video of Pikachu. I show these ball pythons all the time. I never even thought about crossing them. I think you just have to call them spotted balls. Spotted balls coming to you in 2023. However, how cool would that be? You've got two of the most placid snakes in the entire world. You've got a species that gets super duper small, stays super duper small in a spotted python. And then you've also got a ball python, which in my opinion is basically the perfect size snake for most people. So what I think you'd get is an amazing snake with an amazing temperament, an animal that would probably spend quite a bit of time off the ground. But because the spotted pythons are semi-arboreal and ball pythons are being argued to be as well, but definitely more terrestrial in their behavior, what we've seen in captivity and in the wild. I think that you'd get something that spends a little bit more time off the ground, but would be comfortable there because a, a ball python isn't like a fat snake, right? It's a snake that can already climb pretty well. And then you mix 
it with the intelligence of an Antaresia spotted python, and you get that really cool kind of uh, coloration and patterning as well, I think you'd get a ball python looking animal with a different head, with a cool head stamp, with a whole bunch of spots on it. I think overall, you'd have one of the coolest snakes that you'd ever seen in a normal morph. And then what happens if you somehow were able to breed morphs into that? Because here in North America, frogs. Here in North America, we don't really have a whole bunch of morphs with the Antaresia. I don't really know that we have too many at all, where in Australia, where they're from, they have a whole bunch. So that could be interesting. Anyway, ball pythons, there's lots of, you know, walls, which is a, a, a Woma python, a reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons, blood python. They've been bred with basically everything, but not Antaresia yet. What he said. Number three, and this is one I don't agree with. Dart frog hybrids. As you hear the dart frogs up, I don't know why I moved them down here. They're so loud, but they're so cute though. Now, it is generally frowned upon to mix dart frogs, even uh, more. So for example, Tinctorius, right? Dendrobates Tinctorius. There's blue tinks, there's yellow tinks, there's a whole bunch. Generally, you don't mix them because you wanna keep the lines pure and the morphs pure, and then you don't mix species either because it's definitely difficult to get certain species of dart frogs in the hobby. And the main argument against hybrids is muddying the waters. Well, what if you breed this and this and it gets sold as a pure this and now we have, you know what I mean? And that makes sense. But here's the thing. If you breed a ball python to a Burmese python, which we have done, I think they're amazing, right? Burn balls you're not muddying waters. You know that it's a hybrid. You look at it and you know. There is no mixing it up. However, with frogs, especially dart frogs, especially dart frogs that might not ever be able to be brought into the country ever again because of CITES restrictions, then you could be muddying the waters. And that we shouldn't do because dart frogs sometimes look so similar. You get genes mixed up and then you get something sold as a pure locality when it's really not. That can destroy the whole hobby and can make it so that in North America, we don't really know what's what. So that I disagree with. Now, there is a thing that I will say that I, I think uh, I'm more free thinking than a lot of the hobby. Keeping certain species or morphs together that are different, as long as you're not selling the offspring or even bringing the offspring to fruition. Because for example, if you have banded leucamellas with spotted leucamellas, right? These are the black and yellows. Generally, you wanna keep those separate. They're from different locales. But if you put them together, they're gonna live just fine. They're the same species just different locales. You just wouldn't want to bring the offspring to market because then you don't know what's what and you can muddy the waters. But if you keep them together and never ever breed them, I don't see a problem. Same with different tinks. If you keep different Tinctoria species together, who really cares as long as you're watching and you do all the other cohab stuff right, I see no issue. I just don't really agree with making hybrids and breeding them, interbreeding them, I guess. Anyway, let's move on. Number two. Boa Constrictor Emperor and Emerald Tree Boas. Now, Boa Emperors are the BCIs or BIs. These are your common boas, the ones that you can find as babies for 40 bucks at every expo under the sun that come in different morphs. This is what Franny is. Isn't she beautiful? And Emerald Tree Boas. Now, here's why I don't think we've seen these yet, because I think it's totally possible, and I think it'd be doable, and I think they would thrive. However, BCI, a normal boa emperor, is 40 bucks. An emerald tree boa is not. An emerald tree boa will go for thousands of dollars, and when you get into the basins, we're talking sometimes 10 grand plus. So here is why you wouldn't do it, because why on earth, especially you wouldn't go male BI to an uh, emerald tree boa, because why would you waste an emerald tree boa's breeding season, which could like pay your bills for the year, on a clutch of something that maybe nobody would buy, nobody would want, like, that just doesn't make sense. Now, taking an Emerald Tree Boa and putting it to a female BCI or BI, that might make sense. And I think we might see that because that is doable and way less risky, financially anyway. Now, in terms of risk to the animal, of course, I would never recommend breeding anything as a hybrid if you think that there's a great chance of risk. And I don't think there is here. They're from similar parts of the world. They're from South Central America, right? Well, some are from Central and some, you get the idea. Same part of the world. And they have similar requirements, not the same. BIs will be found up in the trees, but they're semi-arboreal, whereas an emerald tree boa, they are completely arboreal. So it'd be interesting. And if we're already breeding ball pythons and green tree pythons, which I mean, I don't know about this one yet, and some people hate it, but if we've already done that, and let's suppose that it works fine, 
what's the issue with breeding a boa to another boa that from almost the same part of the world and have similar characteristics. It'd be interesting to me to see how it goes, and it'd be interesting to me to see how the heads look, because the heads look very different. Emerald tree boas have the longest teeth of any non-venomous snake, and bee eyes don't. I wonder what the color would be. I wonder if you could get green bodies with red tails. That would be interesting. So anyway, let's just move on. Let's round this one out. Number one, blood pythons and angolan pythons. Now, blood pythons have been put with other species, especially ball pythons, where you've got super balls or bloody balls, which I hate that name anyway, but Angolan pythons with blood pythons, who knows? They're not really from similar areas of the world at all. Blood pythons are mostly from Asia and it's an African species, the Angolan python, Angola and surrounding area. Now Angolan pythons do look like ball pythons, and as far as I know, they can interbreed. So if they can interbreed with ball pythons, it's likely they can interbreed with blood pythons. And Angolan pythons generally have a nice temperament and the care requirements are similar, not the same. I actually think that Angolan pythons, they like it quite a bit drier. If I, you know, I'll put the humidity for each species right here to make sure that I'm not wrong. But either way, they're gonna be a much more slender snake, although similar length, where blood pythons are gonna be short and fat. Now, both are gonna be mostly on the ground, although Angolan pythons do exhibit quite a bit of arboreal behavior on rock faces or cliffs anyway. Kind of in between rocks is where they're gonna bask because they like it a little bit hotter than ball pythons. But either way, I don't actually know if this is gonna happen. I just think that Angolan pythons are getting more popular as they should because they're very underrated. And then once we get them more popular and uh, they're not 1500 bucks a pop like they were at the expo, which you can watch the video of right here, I think you're gonna start to see a little bit more experimentation with them. But just right now it doesn't make financial sense and that's why I think you're gonna see that next year. So. Let me know, what do you think is gonna happen in 2023? Do you hate hi hybrids? Do you love hybrids? What would you breed as a hybrid if you could? Let me know in the comments section below while you're down there. Smash the like button, smash subscribe. It really helps this channel. And uh, special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get videos early, discounts on merch. You get to see the Madagascar trip extra early that I'm probably on right now as this video drops. All that and more for as little as a dollar a month. And that's it, because I do videos twice a week. That means I'll see you in the next one.